Welcome to the Make Space for Growth podcast. My name is Sara Vicente Barreto, and I'm your host. I'm a corporate strategist, problem solver, social entrepreneur, writer, mom of two, and passionate for growth at home, in business, and in our community. I am excited to bring you one more guest in season three, Creating Space. I know it's been taking me some time to get here, but when space is crowded, this is what happens. What is it with space? Space is not a single event in time. It's something that you need to continuously have. So as we go through this series, I will keep speaking to our guests about their path, their business, their careers, but also about how they find space, space to explore, space to think, space to feel, and space to be. Join me in this journey to find out how. It is time to create space. Joining me today, I have Daniela Baron Swatch. Daniela is a leader known for driving change at the intersection of the commercial and sustainability impact world. From strategy development to operating execution with more than 15 years of board level experience. She draws upon venture investing, network building and business execution foundations to transform bold ideas into practical solutions. Pioneering is one of the words that we hear more in this interview. Her global outlook, versatility and curiosity enable positive and creative change in complex and in certain environments. Daniela is CEO at Snowball, a diversified investment fund that aims to create positive outcomes for people and planet whilst generating sound financial returns. She's also a non-executive director and Intercontinental Hotels Group and a trustee of the Institute for the Future of Work. Daniela has a Harvard Business School MBA and a BCS in Economics from UNICAP. Among her various accolades that I could go on naming, she's one of the top 100 women in engineering in 2019, 20 people who are changing Brazil and the world for better in 2017, and 100 people who make Britain a better place in 2008. Are you excited to meet her? Because I am. Join me for this interview. Daniela, welcome to the Make Space for Growth podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here at last. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I thought before we go and talk business, maybe let's start with something lighter. May I ask you, what was your favorite thing to do as a child? And what did you want to be when you grew up? The favorite thing I had to do as a, I, I love doing as a child, and I still do today, is the sea. I loved playing on the sea. I loved being on a beach. And, I, and that's still my passion today. I love the sea, whether it is to just watch or engage with it. What did I want to do when I grew up? A million things, but I think the thing that sort of cuts through all the various things that I've always kind of wanted to do was the fact that I grew up in Brazil and seeing a lot of poverty and inequality. I always wanted to do something to reduce that, to eliminate that inequality, that poverty, that injustice. So that was always in the back of my mind. In everything that I thought about, there was always that angle. I didn't really know. I started to volunteer when I was very young. I was 12 when I started volunteering. And I volunteer still throughout my whole life, from 12 to today. In different, my volunteering has changed, but it's still, you know, uh, I still always volunteer. And I started volunteering. I was lucky that my school allowed me to go into slums and, you know, and they organized it in a, you know, an appropriate way. That always then also allowed me to feel and understand what the issues were on a, you know, direct basis. And I think it it increased my resolve to do something about it. And so I didn't know how, because at the time, the only profession that we had was like being a social worker. And I knew that that wasn't, I, I am, I am in awe of social workers because I think what they do is just amazing. But that is not how I function. I, I get very affected by by the day to day of people. So I need to be a step <laughs> removed from that. So I thought of being a politician uh, again. That was very short lived with trying and experiencing it. And so my my path 
to this ended up being very organic. So it's funny because it's not a lot of people that come here with actually being working on what they thought they would be working as a child. And you seem to be an example of that. So maybe let's talk a little well, bit about but, that path, right? You you started yeah. your career in the financial sector. And since yeah. then, then you've been on this uh, journey to change the world in different ways. Can you talk to us maybe, let's start with the early years and why you decided from maybe a more traditional back, background to then move to a place like Save the Children. It is funny because it's it's very easy for me to look back and rationalize it all and it all makes sense. At the time, it didn't make any sense. It happened that I, through my volunteering, you know, I used to volunteer directly with the people that were experiencing whatever issue. But then I I was working in private equity and I was in New York and I had the opportunity to volunteer helping a CEO of a charity to do their business plan and to think through, you know, their next steps. And through that experience, I, I found out that what for me was something very easy, very intuitive. I was working in private equity. I saw business plans every day of the week. And for her was really transformational. And that was the first time that I thought maybe I already have skills that I can apply in a different sector. And maybe I can start now making a difference. And so I wasn't planning on Save the Children per se. This was the opportunity. So the, the idea came and I started to look for it and the right opportunity appeared and save the children. We come with a lot of preconceptions about how charities operate and how they work. And it allowed me to see firsthand how it is both the challenges and the benefits of, of charities and the charitable work that they do and the whole development space. So that was fantastic. And it, it really informed everything I've done since. Yeah, clearly you you started on a path in, in, in this impact world. And then after this, you became CEO of Impetus. Looking back, you were really doing impact investing at a time where this name didn't really exist. <laughs> and yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about the story um, there and, and what were you trying to achieve then? Well, it's interesting. If I sort of step back at what Impetus really really try to achieve is is that the models of traditional finance and traditional philanthropy were not working. And frankly, they're not working today either. Impetus was about finding a better way to achieve greater impact. And it decided to do that by supporting charitable organizations in a whole variety of ways in order for them to be more impactful and be able to scale and grow that impact. So it was it was quite innovative, it was new, it was pioneering at the time. We experimented a lot. We found things that worked, developed and evolved and things that didn't work obviously a lot along the way and, and tried to model that for others as well and try to open up and share and to work collaboratively and in the ecosystem so that we knew the bit that we were able to do and the limits of what we were able to do. And we wanted to prepare almost like a value chain of impact. We knew what needed to happen before us, the bit that we had to do and the bit that we need to position for later so that overall that difference, that impact on the ground was being felt. And the focus that we had was children and young people in the UK. And that was because we weren't big enough to do more. You know, I think everybody wanted to do more, but we felt let's focus and really make a difference, make a dent on a, on a limited area, which was disadvantage children and young people to improve their education prospects and career prospects. So very, very limited. And we wanted to make a deep impact on that. So that's what it was about. Yeah. And I think that's actually when I first met you was that at that time. I wanted yeah. to just do um, a side note before we go into your, your next, I guess, move. Along the way, you've been part of a few boards. 
and you still are. And I know that many women wonder about joining boards. When's the right time? What board? And how do I do it? Did you have a strategy when you started? And and why was it important for you to to join a board? It is interesting. It, yes, I kind of had a strategy, and 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 my strategy was knowing that I was a really odd ball for the traditional corporate bo- board, and so I was trying to kind of ask people why would you have me on a board you know like what is it that i need to do and what is it that i have to offer when we think about rather than just what do i want and i wanted it because i kind of thought you know i had been at the time working mostly in the philanthropic arena and i thought well i don't want my root and my background is business and i didn't want to lose touch with that kind of business you know end of it so i thought a board would be you know a good way to balance that and to have continue to have that experience and so that was what i thought and that was where what motivated me but then he was thinking actually there is no point if i don't have something to offer if i don't have value to to add to a board and it was really interesting in unpicking that value so what i did was to talk to people that i trusted in headhunters then i talked to friends and other people that i knew who were on boards of big FTSE companies and to understand how the board operates what did i need to do how did i better understand you know how to position myself and frankly i had been on boards you know since i was in private equity i sat on boards of investments that we did and so the behavioral side of the board which means the difference between being an executive and being a non-executive, that bit I already understood and knew what to do. And a lot of the times this is a blockage for a lot of people that come from having just an executive experience, going to a non-executive experience to understand where you need to add value. So I did that. So I, I reframed my CV for a, to be like a board CV rather than an executive CV. I then talked to inspirational women who I knew were on boards. I was very courageous in contacting some people that were very, very senior and experienced and that I barely knew. You know, worst thing that can happen is they might not, you know, they might not respond. So what, you know, no difference there, right? And some of them responded, which was brilliant. And they were very insightful and helpful to me. I then really dug deep into really understanding where I was going to add value and condense this into three points. What are the three key points that I can add value to this board? And I then do a lot of due diligence on the company, the people and the fit. You know, especially for a FTSE board, you don't want to get it wrong. I I was a CEO at the time, so I knew I could only get one board uh, on top of my full-time role. So in that sense, I needed to find out that the board was right. So that was the process that I went through. And those are a lot of, of tips right there in terms of how to approach it, which which are very helpful, especially in terms of you figuring out the three bullets of the value, because sometimes that is really where all the story is. Moving back to your path, because you're still on this path of uh, of changing the world, I guess. So more recently, you became the CEO of uh, Granito and now Snowball. Can you tell us this journey and and the, how did it evolve from your prior positions and to into getting here over time? So since I moved from private equity to the social sector and speaking at social sector very broadly here, I really try to understand what the drivers were. You know, and important for me was can I shape and help shape the culture? Uh, who are the people that I'm working with? Purpose is number one. And then I look at the opportunity. What is the opportunity here? And I'm interested in impact at scale. So the opportunity needs to be commercially viable and not niche, but really scalable. Even if in the beginning it is small and pioneering. And so, for example, you know, Granito is is an ambitious organization that wanted to pioneer pathways to financing projects or, you know, in a whole variety of ways that were pathfinders, but then to replicate them, mainly opening 
avenues for more funding going from the global north to the global south. And Snowball is also a pioneering organization. So Snowball was the first fund of its kind globally. And it aimed to optimize for risk, return, and impact. And for that is a really very diversified portfolio with a scalable model and with the overall goal to make impact investing accessible for all. So like really democratic. And now we have a six year track record with this strategy and impact investing is everything that we do. It's not a part of our company, it's all we do. We now have the expertise of it that we have tried, tested, embedded, tried again, refreshed, retested, and, and that's excellent. And what we offer to investors is a really diversified investment vehicle that really steward capital for, for long term and competitive returns, but also deep impact. Uh, our methodology and the way that we approach it is still puts us, even though other funds like us have emerged, which is a great thing. You know, we need a lot more to emerge and we need a lot more good things in impact investing. We're still amongst those delivering the deepest impact. And and I, I find that amazing because as I said, I think what's interesting is that, and I think the reason we came across originally was when I was coming out of MBA and I was gonna, I was trying to join this VC social sector. They didn't even have a name at the time. Yeah, venture and philanthropy. Yeah, exactly. It was a mix of names and people were like, what's that? Are you going to work in charity? I'm like, well, no, but it's this, it's private equity. And everyone thought I was a little bit like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I ended up going back to the to the financial sector. And and looking back, I'm, I think I'm approaching my, my 13 year or 15 year reunion at some point. And that was then, right? And and now you are clearly, you seem to be one of many, but the truth is it's been a journey of all this time to nail how you do it. And as you say, to do it at scale and to do it with competitive returns, because I think that's the part that yes. a lot of people still feel like they have to compromise and that that it's a choice. So, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm here like all excited listening to you because I'm like, wow, I've like, I've almost watched all this grow. <laughs> in the in the background um and and now it has a fancy name and now everyone talks about it so yeah. and, uh, it's it's impressive and i appreciate the you sharing the the journey and so as you look forward what's your vision for how snowball goes from here and how do you pursue it in your day to day yeah it's so interesting because our vision is very big and the day to day is nitty gritty right so you have to combine and see that every step you do on the nitty gritty of the day to day is getting you closer to the bigger picture of your vision and for us really is is really a world where every investment creates a positive impact for people and planet and i know it sounds very cliche but that is really true because every investment has an impact you know whether we account for it or not you know every investment is having an impact all our investments everything we've done every action that we have has an impact. The difference is that we want everyone to account for that. And I think from a vision perspective and the way that we think about it is that really investment activity is what shapes our world and is what creates our future. It invents a new future. Depending on what you fund and what doesn't get funded is a future that is being created or not. But what is the kind of world that we're shaping, right? What is the future we're now inventing for our children, grandchildren, and the next generations? So what's happening today is that we externalize the responsibility for the social and environmental consequences of our investment, right? The data now tells us that as investors, we are in danger, right, of putting people and planet at critical risk. We're seeing this every day in our TV screens, every day in the news. So what we are doing at Snowball is we are internalizing those responsibilities for society and the planet so that we have an investment system that is serving humanity and the planet and the natural environment rather than the other way around, rather than exploiting people and planet and natural resources for financial gains, 
we can have financial gains that also benefit society and the planet. This is possible. We've been doing this for six years. And I think the beauty is that there are more and more investable opportunities as we move along. Because business is the most powerful force invented, really. It can solve problems as effectively as it creates them. Uh, if we look at it in that way, and I think if we really are committed to finding those solutions, those opportunities, those innovations, that is the way that we go. We created with this product and this approach that others also have. We're not the only ones with this impact approach, but it's a, it's a new and better way to invest, to support business activity that, that really optimizes for risk return and impact. And what I see and the vision that I have is that the word impact investing ceases to exist because it will become investing. It should become the future or of all investment activities. And in our case, in Snowball, and that's why I'm so passionate about it, is the future is already here. It's happening. So very excited. What we want is that it happens everywhere else as well. And, and I think the opportunity is, is open for that. Yeah, I guess you want to go from a better way to invest to the way to invest. I think that, that's mission accomplished at, 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 at some point. And so you talked yeah. about opportunities. What, what do you see are the big opportunities um, that lie ahead in this space? Oh my God, so many, really. <laughs> I mean, energy transition. I mean, that was obvious that you're going to say that. Yeah in our faces, energy transition, energy sovereignty, electricity production contributes 25% of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. That's the size of the problem. And actually the solutions are already here. Yes, we still need more battery storage. We need to do better at storing this energy, but creation of renewable sources of energy are already cheaper than fossil fuels. And we should take advantage of this crisis to lean in and go deeper and further into this energy transition. And it's interesting in Snowball, we look at both sides of that equation. We look at the green economy, but also at social equity. And so when we talk about transition to a green economy, to a renewable, to a sustainable economy, we want it to be done as a just transition so that it doesn't leave behind the people that would be unemployed, the people that will suffer with that. You know, we need to carry everybody along with us. So another theme that is again a big theme and equity and inclusion right so what is what is one of the key issues that we need to address is for example inequality of opportunity and 1.7 billion people are unbanked globally and that leads to poor opportunities for economic and economic growth and the financial betterment so just that prevents people from having a house from uh, having jobs or getting a loan or anything else. So this is a massive issue. And so, for example, one of the things that we invest in is access to loans and financial products for SMEs, micro SMEs, and even microfinance, serving the bottom of the pyramid, for example. You know, in, and also improving funding for women-owned and women-operated uh, businesses. So things that will address that inequality, that's another big area of opportunity. Another big area of opportunity, regenerative ecosystems, right? The circular economy, you know, we are overshooting the two degree heating and we have had over 65% of biodiversity loss globally in the last 50 years. And a quarter of the Earth's productive land is already degraded. So how do we maintain our systems? How do we feed people? How do we keep farming land in a way that is regenerative? And so it's about a resilient economy that, and the stuff that we invest in is sustainable forestry, right? Agriculture and fish yields using sustainable practice, increasing the, that yield, but using sustainable practices. Sequesters of carbon, and, and protection of biodiversity, and so on and so forth. There are so many opportunities. 
yeah. really and these are all profitable profitably done you know so it's not that you have to sacrifice your profits in order to do this and we need to always reflect on how our growth is happening so yes you can always increase your profits by being more exploitative and you shouldn't do that but you can do all those activities profitably i want to change gears a little bit and now focus on you daniela and a bit less on on the business so you've you've had multiple ceo positions and you've been a leader what what has been similar and what do you think has been radically different over the last say 15 years in yours your ceo at impetus granito snowball what's similar between those three uh, things you mentioned was they're all high purpose pioneering in their fields deep impact and i joined them when they were all early stage i think what's different between all of them is how to get there, how to get to impact. They all had different business models. They all had different pathways and different sort of impact goals as well. So if I kind of take a big picture approach, the difference is the way to get there. Again, I know there's probably been a lot of different challenges and different um, nuances to the to your CEO roles. But as a CEO, what has been your greatest challenge? If I think of the three last years, which is the years that I've been at Snowball, I would say some of them are, are early stage company challenges. So, you know, trying to gain awareness, putting your name out in the market, especially when you're pioneering something. I think uh, you have to educate the market as well because people have different understandings of impact investing. They confuse it with ESG investing. And, you know, and again, there is a little uh, soup of, of, of little alphabet soup, isn't it, with, with all those acronyms. So it, there is an element of educating, which, which brings some challenge uh, when you're pioneering something as well. Again, the challenge in the last three years to establish our credibility, which we now have established, which is fantastic. And because we're growing, there's always a challenge in hiring talent. So, and and in um, when the company is beginning like this, in a way, sort of first 10 years, it's very important that you get the talent right because that's what creates the culture, that's what's going to make the difference. These are the people that will really make or break it, you know? So I would say those are the those are the sort of big challenges. And what do you think is the characteristic that defines you as a CEO? To be honest, I think I care deeply. I really care about the mission. I'm very mission driven and I really care about the people. I always hire people that are not yes people. So people that can challenge me, people that can challenge what we're doing and people that are constructive and can build something together. So I would say that I would say that in general, in, in terms of like big, big sort of picture again. And I would say that in terms of traits and abilities, I can operate at a very high picture strategic level, but also down to the detail. And, and that I would say for the sort of earlier stage organizations is, is super helpful when the organization is at that stage, because you have to navigate between the detail and the big picture all the time. Yes, for sure. And so one of the things CEOs many times struggle with um, is to create kind of that space to work on the business and have that big picture rather than the day to day of the business. Do you have a few tips of how you articulate between those and, and how you do it? It's really hard. <laughs> it's hard because, you know, you're you're creating and you're growing a business, and especially when you're growing, everything pulls you into the business. You need a lot of discipline for I think to create time for yourself and also to create time to think about the business as a whole, you know, and part of I think what illuminates that is bringing also being exposed to different things. So bringing external knowledge, bringing talking to different people that also kind of, you know, stimulate new ideas and allows you to Every time I'm presented with a new business, a new impact, something that is happening in this space, it's a immediate contrasting with what are we doing? What can we learn? What is it about? And I'm very curious about it. I think that helps 
to think about the business as a whole and then just taking some space and and talking about the business with the people in the business on that strategy and space for reflection. There is no way about it. And it's always a challenge. I don't think I have it nailed down perfectly at all. <laughs> it's it's interesting because you, you talked about space. So I'm going to I'm going to jump around a little bit because that is the, the theme of of the podcast. What is important? whether at home or in business, for you to create space for? I meditate and I think it's important for me to meditate because it keeps me grounded. It keeps me with the right perspective because I think if you don't have that time out for yourself, at least speaking personally, I think different people are different. But if I don't have that time out for myself, I really then start to get too tunnel vision into the business and into the things that need to be done versus keeping that perspective and being able to see and spot opportunities and and also you know that is in relation to the business but that is also important for me and my own personal growth my own self-awareness my own uh development as a person you shared a little bit of how do you take steps in the business to make space and to actually alternate what about in your in your day to day life? And I mean, we, we I think we took like what three years to be able to schedule this podcast. <laughs> which, I know, and which, that's which is smart. great. And <laughs> it, it's entirely shared fault. You know, I'm always looking for. We kind of know what's important, and and I think you you know what's important for you. How do you make sure that you actually do that and you spend that time and, and you create space for you? Yeah, you have to say no to a lot of things. And I, I'm not, you know, I love lots of things, so it's hard for me to say no, but I'm so much better at it now uh, than I used to be. Exactly this, what you said, what are the things that are important? It is important for me to meditate every day. It is important for me to go on a walk with my dog every day and for the dog as well. <laughs> it is important for me to spend quality time with my partner every day. You know, so those things I have, you know, yeah, the odd day I don't make time for it or I'm too busy. Really that these things I preserve. And, and you know, and then you have to take care of your health. You have to cook. You have to, you know, properly. You have to exercise. So I have to make space for all those things in my life because otherwise I know I can get very imbalanced and also being more, I think, really disciplined with the to-do list uh, in a way uh, of knowing what the to-do list is, but also not having the ambition to finish the to-do list because the, that will always, it's a perennial thing. I've, yeah. I've been working for 30 years and my to-do list never ended, never. I've never had a time or a day where it's like, I have nothing in my to-do list. I don't think ever. So it will never go away. And the more we can live with that. <laughs> I think what's you interesting know? about the to-do list is, I think I heard it on Thrive by Irene Huffington, which is taking something off your to-do list is actually perfectly acceptable. It's just as completing a task Taking one out, it's just ah, as fun. Yeah, like meaning just saying, I'm not doing that. And exactly. Yeah. And 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 you talk about, you know, the you have to be ruthless about saying no. And it's been interesting yeah. because I think one of our my early guests in the podcast, you know, I ended up labeling the episode, it's okay to say no, because it's it was and I think it was something that to be fair, came a lot more in the last three years because suddenly there was this space, this unwanted space in our lives uh -huh. uh, that was created with the pandemic and isolation and all the, the bad stuff that came with it. But suddenly we're like, oh, hang on. Actually, this is quite nice. There's an element of it that is nice. And as we went back to this new life, it was like, oh, I'm not sure I want to be saying yes to everything anymore. And yeah. uh, and and that's that's a bit of a realization of, of the last few years, even more than before. The assumption was you say yes to everything. You're supposed to do everything. I've been trying not to dwell on the pandemic on the podcast anymore, even though it started because of that. But to this point of let's not go back to everything being the same. What did what change what's your new normal? What changed and you're like, you know what, not interested in having that back? I don't do rush hour. So it means I can go to the office or to a meeting super early. So it's not that I don't wake up early or whatever. I wake up super early, have always done that. But it's like, I can go super early or I can go after rush hour. 
I just don't do rush hour. So that is a small but so meaningful change for me in my quality of life. You know, again, I think, as you say, it's for some cases it's necessary. In your case, it was something you could do and, and it is huge. And was there something that you suddenly found yourself with space with in the pandemic and that actually you started doing and 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 continued and enjoyed it and brought it as a new thing? You know, I have to confess that I was even busier in the pandemic. I mean, it's I had no space in the pandemic. We were growing, we were restructuring some of what, like the legal structure of Snowball to accommodate new investors. We were so busy. It was like we were certifying as a B Corp. We, you know, like in the first year we certified, we already top 5% of the global B Corp. So we were so happy about that. But we were, you know, doing all of those things that in a way is kind of is, is the work that nobody sees, but it, we were so, so busy. So I am and, and, you know, and doing business as usual. So this is all on top. So I unfortunately did not find myself with any extra space at all during the pandemic. So yeah. looking back, what advice would you would you give yourself to the Danielle at the beginning of 2020, not knowing what things were going to look like? I felt again, you know, I am very grateful and very feel very privileged to have not been under threat in the pandemic, not threat, not threat of my job, of my house, of my health, you know, so I, I was in a very privileged position. And so in that sense, I think what the pandemic brought was this great gratitude about that, but also acknowledgement you know i i'm always linked with the social issues and 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 all of that and i think you know uh, uh, the sense of that privilege and how many people that don't have that privilege and how many people that really suffered and i think i don't have any particular advice because i i took the pandemic really well i wasn't nervous myself i had one moment which was about the duration of a month when both my parents, uh, who are old, got uh, COVID before the vaccine was available. And then I really freaked out. That was a moment of despair because I was so far from them. They're both in Brazil. I was like, oh my God, I have to go. And I, I kept telling my partner, I'm going. Even if I have to swim there, I'll go. And other than that moment in time, my pandemic was quite... Uh, you know, I took it every day as it came and I tried, I had the fortune of taking advice and the advice that was given to me right in the beginning of the pandemic. So that was a, that was the good advice. And I got that advice at the right time. It wasn't from me to myself, but it was from someone else. And it was the advice uh, which was fantastic. And it basically said, look, you have one goal. And your goal is to survive this. And really, with that mindset, my concern then went for the well-being of my team, the well-being of the staff, the well-being of the people around me, and basically, you know, saying, okay, if with that we are able to restructure legally, great. If with that we're able to, to get a big corp status, great. But I want people to be okay, you know, and what is it that I can do to uh, to to improve prove them being okay. I think that is excellent visionary advice that you that you received there. Uh, Daniela, this has been great. I have two short questions to to close us up, uh, which I, I always ask a little bit as a, as a forward. Do you have one book recommendation or that book that you think that everybody should read? This is one that every woman should read. Every woman should read. And it's a book that's called Difficult Women. And it's the, the history of feminism in 11 battles. And it is really easy to read. It's, it's a page turner. It's so interesting. And it tells you the history as well as the dynamics at play. And I think for every woman, we all need to read it. We oh, all need to be fully aware. I haven't read that one. And if you have one word to describe this year or that you focus on for this year, like your word of the year, what would that be? I think patience and lightness, because I think, you know, I think me, I know I'm not the only one that experienced this, but when we were feeling like almost elated 
from coming at the end of this pandemic than the Ru Russia invaded Ukraine. It was about that time. You know, it was about the time when you kind of your heart is filling with hope that you're going to sort of things are going to, you know, be better and, and all of that sort of stuff and you can repair some of the things, then this happens. So I think, you know, the the way to keep at it, you know, and to not despair, it's to be light. Tanya, <laughs> this has been amazing. Thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. For inviting me and so sorry that it's been so long. <laughs> no, again, it was, it was shared fault of lack of space. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> All the best, Sarah. Thank you. Can you tell what a great time I had interviewing Daniela? Little did I know when she first spoke to me about investing 15 years ago that we would be having this conversation today. Daniela has, from a young age, had a sense of purpose. That has permeated her many career choices and is a key driver in her day to day. She has also been perfecting the art of making an impact at scale and through business to ensure it is there for the long term. I am truly inspired by her perspective, all while ensuring she goes from the detail to the strategic, making space to focus on the opportunities that lie ahead. I trust you have also enjoyed this conversation. Let me know your favorite bits. This podcast is produced by Alice Tensfield. Until the next one, I get to do this.